Hello, and thank you for joining us for the third lecture in our spring webinar series. My name is Deborah Hurd, and I'm the project coordinator for the Department of Black Studies 50th anniversary here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. To mark this milestone, the department is hosting a year-long series of events, including this webinar series. Two of the primary goals of these webinars is one, to educate the general public about the history and experience of Black Omaha, and two, to exhibit the unique methodological approaches and range of research within Black, African-American, Africana, Pan-African, African and African diaspora studies, demonstrating the growth of the discipline over the past 50 years. In everything that we do this year, we call upon and lift up the name of the Omaha 54. The date of November 10th, 1969, the day when 54 Black UNO students were arrested for staging a sit-in in the president's office is significant not only because of its direct relationship to the founding of this department in the fall of 1971, it is significant to the entire university because the Omaha 54 changed the face and the course of this university by demanding space within which students could engage in the study and analysis of issues concerning African and African descended peoples from an intellectual basis that, it, that in and of itself is grounded in the cultural logic of African and African descendant peoples. The recognition of these demands not only created the academic space for a black studies department, but like at other universities around the country, uh, around the country, it also created the space for Latinos and Latin Americans, Asians and Asian Americans, Native Americans and women to have their voices heard and to receive the scholarly recognition to which they are also due. We are the legacy of the 54 and for their persistence and their sacrifice and for the 50 years of unwavering support from the black community in Omaha, we offer our humble thanks and we salute you. Called from the beginning to reflect upon, study, analyze and critique the continuing effects of enslavement colonization and land dispossession, we cannot help but acknowledge that this university sits on the sacred tribal lands of the Native American people for whom the city is named, the Omaha, and that of other First Nation people who regarded this land as their communal homeland. We stand in solidarity with you. And to the oppressed people of the world, whether suffering from military coups, environmental disasters, vaccine neglect, economic victimization, and a host of other global society ills. We support you, we stand in solidarity with you, and we pray for the triumph of freedom, fairness, liberation, and peace. Today, it is my great honor to introduce to you the speaker of the hour, Dr. Quincy Mills. Dr. Mills earned a Bachelor of Science in Business from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign an MBA from DePaul University, an MA in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago, and a PhD in History from the University of Chicago. His teaching and research interests include Black businesses and social movements. He is the author of Cutting Along the Color Line, Black Barbers and Barbershops in America. He is currently working on a new book tentatively titled The Wages of Resistance, Financing the Black Freedom Movement. Now, if you want to know how one goes from a degree in business to studying history, I found the perfect answer from Dr. Mills' website, in which he writes, I am originally from the south side of Chicago. I majored in business at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is not the typical pedigree of a history professor. Like many students of color, I had planned to enter a field with markers of success and mobility, business, medicine, or law. Yet the study of history served as an intriguing interest that occupied many of my electives when I stole away from financial derivatives, marketing plans, and balance sheets. This interest proved so strong that in my senior year, I did a, an independent research project with a history professor on the all black town of Mound Bayou, Mississippi. This paper of thesis length and quality won a campus essay competition as well as a national award. While I was more than content with this work and to stick with business after graduation, my professor encouraged me to consider history as a profession. 
After graduation, I worked as an underwriter at an insurance company and started working on an MBA at DePaul University, studying entrepreneurship. But the study of history was too strong of a pull to brush aside. I left the corporate world and entered an MA program in the social sciences at the University of Chicago. This was the springboard, springboard to a doctoral program in history, also at U of C. So let me ask you a couple of questions. So we, we've gotten how we go from business to, to history. Uh, who are some of the Black historians and or Black social, uh, Black studies scholars that have inspired you or that you look up to? Uh, there's certainly many, uh, but in, in the interest of time, uh, I'll say two uh, uh, would be Barbara Ransby uh, and Robin Kelly. Uh, and I say those two, one, the scholarship is just, you know, unmatched. Um, both bring a deep um, historical study of the Black radical tradition. Um, uh, they bring a deep study of, uh, of Black communities. Um, and, and, and I would argue, uh, you know, uh, uh, deep theories of liberation and freedom. Uh, more than that, though, I think that their own, their own activism and politics <laughs> uh, are also un, un, unmatched, uh, I think, in terms of activist scholars um, as models. Um, again, thinking about the roots of Black studies um, in our current time, they are uh, uh, on at the forefront uh, among academics um, who are uh, fighting for social for social justice, um, and so you know I think those are two that you know I I read their work, uh, I assign their work, um, uh, uh, and I follow what they're doing outside of outside of uh, their scholarly work, and so all that matters to me, uh, and I you know frankly just you know if I was if I could just be a tenth of who they are, I'd be I'd be fantastic, right? So, uh, I'd say those two. And um, uh, just to be clear, uh, Barbara Ransby has written a biography of um, Ella Baker, uh, and her most recent uh, biography is of um, uh, Eslanda Robson. Um, and then Kelly uh, has written a number of books from Hammer and Ho about Black communists and. Alabama uh, to um, uh, Freedom Dreams, uh, a biography of Thelonious Muck, uh, among other uh, canonical texts. So uh, I would say those are two folks that I, that I look up to. Okay. And so my, my second question is a, a kind of a segue to pass the baton over to you mm -hmm. is about how you ended up studying barbershops. Uh, because when you, when you think about the barbershop, the barbershop is, one of those mainstays in the black community, mm -hmm. you know, unless unless you grow up in a family that has decided that they're not going to cut their child's hair, uh, most boys that's a rite of passage when they turn either one or two is that first trip to the barber shop, mm -hmm. and from then it, it becomes something that's that's a regular part of their lives. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up? Um, thinking about this institution as, as a, a place of historical uh, significance that needed to be studied. Yeah, so I was, so um, right before I started my um, PhD program in, in the fall of 2000, uh, so that summer of 2000, um, uh, Professor Melissa Harris, Lace, I then her name was uh, Lacewell, now it's Melissa Harris Perry, um, who's now at um, Wake Forest. Uh, she was working on her own, her, her first book, uh, which is now titled Barbershops, uh, Bibles and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought. Um, and she wanted, she needed someone to, to sort of do a, uh, an ethnography of a barbershop on the South Side of Chicago. Uh, she thought that if she sat in the barbershop for days on end, that she would alter the space um, and so, again, I'm a native of Southside Chicago, uh, and so she, you know, contracted me to sort of do that ethnography. So that summer, I sat in this barbershop. Uh, uh, I'm not sure who else, if there's anyone here from, from Chicago, but um, uh, uh, Truth and Soul, and it's between Stoney Allen and Jeffrey. Um, and so I sat in that shop for, you know, I don't know, uh, four to five days a week, um, and this is, this is a moment where Venus and Serena 
were really burning up the tennis courts um, where Bush was running for president. Um, and so there was a lot to talk about. There was a lot on, on uh, uh, the TV, the news. Uh, and so, but I sat in the shop and I just watched the, the interactions uh, of the folk coming in and out, of the barbers, uh, chatted with the barbers often. And I just couldn't help but wonder uh, what this space looked like historically. Uh, were barbershops this robust in the 1950s? Uh, what about the 1850s? Uh, and surprisingly, there had not been any work uh, at the time done on a history of Black barbershops. And there had been quite a bit of uh, material done, not uh, quite a bit, on, um, uh, on Black beauty culture, uh, but not so much barbershops. And so I, you know, I thought this would be a, something to, at the very least, look into to see if there was something there. So as I started down this road, came across this barber uh, named George Myers. And George Myers uh, was a barber in Cleveland, Ohio uh, in the late 19th century through uh, 1933. Uh, he passed away in 1933. 30, 30, uh, and Myers, uh, he was all over the you know Black newspapers. He was connected with Booker T. Washington. Um, he was, his name was tossed around in, in terms of uh, Ohio Republican politics. Uh, and I'm thinking, who the, the heck is this barber? Um, Myers, uh, what, what was interesting at the time, right, was that Myers only groomed wealthy white men and politicians in his shop. This was definitely not the barber shop I, was, I thought I would find. Um, and I was significantly intrigued. Moreover, uh, Myers had about, well, let's see, five, six uh, rolls of microfilm of personal papers in the Ohio Historical Society. And I thought, who is this borrower that has so, does such a, a rich and expansive collection of personal papers? Again, not the kind of borrower I was sort of looking for, uh, but one who I'm glad that, glad that I found. Uh, and upon further inquiry, it, it was clear that, you know, Myers was not an aberration. Uh, so Myers actually uh, was William McKinley's barber before McKinley was, was elected president. At the point that McKinley was elected president in 1896, um, Myers got this flood of, uh, of letters from African-Americans in Ohio, but also uh, across the country and particularly from the South. Uh, these letters said, yo, I, you know, Myers, I, you know, I see that uh, you helped. <laughs> Uh, McKinley get elected as president. Uh, can you put in a good word for me uh, to be the recorder of deeds here in Mobile, Alabama? Or can you put in a word for me to be treasurer? Right. So, uh, folks saw Myers as this as as this arbiter, right, that would help deliver patronage politics um, uh, uh, to reward black voters for helping. Uh, McKinley uh, gain office. Um, and so again, right, how did Myers get to this kind of position uh, and what do we make of it? And so that sort of, you know, launched me into this larger project um, uh, of barbershops. Um, so let me take a second though, uh, uh, before I get further deep into this work, just to say thank you, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, one, thank you, Deborah Hurd, for uh, inviting me uh, to participate and to be in community and dialogue with you, with with you all in the community at the University of Nebraska Omaha. Uh, thank you to Dr. Cynthia Robinson as chair uh, of the Department of Black Studies. Um, uh, again, I'm you know I uh, I. I used to teach at Vassar, I now teach at the University of Maryland, but I used to teach at Vassar College and I was the um, uh, director of the Africana Studies um, program there. And so um, I know the work that you're doing uh, and I know the heavy lift, uh, but also the, the, the deep joy uh, that can simply come with uh, directing a Black Studies program. So uh, hello and hats off to you for all your work. Um, uh, and again, uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for having me here. Um, so let's sort of think a bit here about what we're to talk about. Uh, so dispatch is from the barber's chair. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen uh, and I'm gonna, there's a number of um, 
images that we'll just sort of, I'll just sort of scroll through here um, as I, as I um, move through my talk. I think that'll just, so that's, that's going to sit here um, for now. So why should we care about um, barbers and barbershops? Um, were they stops for the Underground Railroad? Uh, were, were major pieces of legislation conceived in their back rooms? Uh, were the barbers uh, famous? Uh, the answers to some of these questions are certainly yes. <laughs> However, the issue is not so much the answer, but rather the questions. We seldom stop to consider how our everyday lives are steeped in the everyday contingencies of historical processes. The food we eat, um, the clothes we wear, the routes that we take to the post office, uh, our play in the park, our play with ideas, um, our play in the creative quest uh, toward freedom and liberation. And yes, our routines to sit in a chair and trust someone to remake, to make and to remake us. As we celebrate Black History Month in February and Black history throughout the year, uh, I argue that it's important uh, that we center the people and the institutions that structure Black everyday life. In fact, it's quite fitting that I join you to talk about Black barbers and barbershops in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Black studies at the University of Nebraska Omaha. To be clear, I know absolutely nothing about the Black community in Omaha or its history say for the bit that I know about Malcolm X and his family's time there. And I'm sure that you all are very used to, <laughs> to that answer. Uh, but what I know about black culture, um, though it's certainly not monolithic, there are certain customs and institutions that look, feel and act quite similar even when they are very different. More specifically, the task I have set for myself this evening is to offer what I hope will be a compelling argument that the core principles of the founding of Black Studies in the late 60s and early 70s, those principles which are autonomy and, and independence, democratic and community engagement, um, and, and the study and inquiry of the Black experience, that these are deeply rooted in the character of Black barbershops. So I'm going to proceed in three parts here. Um, first, I'm going to read a short essay um, uh, on my reflections uh, on the relationship between past and present in Black barbershops. Second, I'll provide a brief sort of history of Black men's experiences in the barbering industry and the significance of barbershops in Black communities over time. And lastly, I'll make some connections between barbershops and, um, and Black studies. Uh, so about a year ago, I was asked by um, a young brother who was putting together this uh, photographic um, uh, essay book uh, uh, on, on Black barbershops. Uh, and so he asked me to reflect on, to reflect on the history of barbers uh, and the history of barbershops, uh, given my research um, through my book. Um, and so I, I just want to just give this, uh, this brother a good shout because, again, it's a really great work. The title of the book is, is You Next, uh, Reflections uh, in Black Barbershops. Um, and so I titled my essay for this piece, uh, You After. So to be clear, you next is the, the sort of, you know, uh, colloquial term that barbers will sort of use to signal to a uh, a customer that they will be next in the chair, right? Uh, as anyone who's been to a barbershop, whether as a, as a one who's to get a haircut or to bring a, uh, a partner or a son or a nephew to get a haircut, uh, sometimes you can wait for a long time. <laughs> uh, and so hearing that you next is great hope that, okay, after about 45 minutes of waiting, I'm next. Uh, but I wanted to sort of reflect historically to say, instead of thinking about who's next, um, or thinking about being next, let's talk about uh, what it means to come after. So I uh, uh, titled my essay, uh, You After. 
And so I'm going to read that here, and then I'll go into the second, the, the second part of my, of my talk. What does it mean to be next? If we respond too quickly, the answer might turn to the individual with excitement, um, angst, or ambivalent expectations of the future. Yet to be next encourages us to consider who and what we are following. Therefore, another way of considering time and one's place in it is to ask, what does it mean to come after? As a black man, the grandson of a late barber and a historian of black barbershops, it is humbling to reflect on the countless people who stood behind the barber's chair, sat and squirmed in the chair while being groomed and waited in that row of seats for their turn and in community. Any history of black barbershops is, is by necessity a collective one that includes the barber, the patron, or the customer, and the waiting public, all in concert. Black barbers come after a litany of black men and women who defined the American commercial ethos of customer service. Despite in some cases being dehumanized, disrespected, and, dis and disavowed, they brought immaculate chaise to all who sat in their chairs, even to enslavers. Barbering in the 19th and 20th centuries provided a path toward freedom and economic autonomy. All labor, all people want control over their lives, which runs counter to the aims of a capitalist economy that requires labor to be in constant production. Barbering is an exit ramp from wage labor. Black men's objectives of controlling the fruits of their labor met black customers' needs and desires of looking and feeling good. Black men have the freedom to, to, uh, to seek out any barber of their choice Yet many frequent black barbers because they trust these barbers know how to cut and trim their hair at minimum and all hair types at lar uh, writ large. Beyond the expectations of skill, black customers expect that their barbers will appreciate the latest hairstyles in black cultural production. This level of trust and intimacy is, is no small matter. The transaction between barber and customer is at once economic and personal. A barber could remake a man after a week of hard, dirty labor in a West Virginia coal mine. A hat constantly covering one's head as a Pullman porter on the train or the intensity, toil and sweat of practice uh, for the upcoming Negro League baseball contest. A shave and haircut could instill confidence in a man preparing to ask his partner to marry him preparing to stand before a congregation on Sunday to deliver the word of God, or even before an assemblage of protesters ready to disrupt a racist society, or simply in preparation to stand and be in public with pride in one's appearance and joy. But before the world sees these transformations, the shop serves as the inner world of construction. While men have, have waited to be the next person to undergo such transformations, they talk, laugh, sneer, debate, shudder, listen, and sit in silence. The combination of barbers, patrons in the chair and a group of, of people waiting combined with the production of black culture have historically defined the very significance of these shops. Many black men were in barbershops when news spread of the Brown v. Board of Education decision or Shirley Chisholm's announcement of running for president of the United States and Nelson Mandela's release from prison. They likely discussed the differences between freedom and liberation, manhood and personhood, and the state of the African diaspora. In all, historically, there were few places in the public sphere where black men could escape the surveillance of a white public, pursue economic autonomy, and shape individual lives and worldviews, considering who we come after makes being next all the more scary and glorious. And so I began by offering uh, that essay to say that um, there's a way in which, you know, we can think historically about these spaces, but again, I think past and present have to be connected. They are connected. Um, and so 
uh, uh, it's important to sort of think about uh, not just what happened before, but indeed how barbers now, right, uh, think about their work and their profession um, and, uh, 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 and how customers sort of, again, step into this space and step into these barber chairs, uh, uh, not just to get groomed, uh, but also, again, to be in community with other folks. And so uh, uh, Deborah Heard asked me earlier how I got into this, into, into this project, uh, and I provided a brief answer. Another answer here I think is, 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 is really important, um, and that is uh, when I went to interview barbers, so I got started the project and went to interview barbers um, who had either owned or worked in the barbershop any time before 1970. So these are older barbers. Um, and when I went south, uh, particularly to, to Atlanta and Durham, um, I'm, I was met with considerable resistance. Uh, and to be clear, while I have a lot of gray hair and my, my afro is fairly, fairly short, at the time in 2003, um, I had long dreadlocks uh, that came down to my waist. Uh, I had expected that I would get uh, jokes <laughs> about wanting to cut my locks. Uh, um, um, but I wasn't expecting the resistance. And so the barbers, right, came at me and said, well, how does it look to, look to me that you want to talk about barbering, but you haven't cut your hair in, in I don't know how long? Or uh, another barber said, uh, I'm in the grooming business and you don't look groomed. Um, another, yet another barber said, um, uh, uh, we don't like that kind of hair. That kind of hair was, again, long dreadlocks. We don't like that kind of hair. Um, and they wouldn't do an interview with me. Um, I did get other interviews, certainly in the South and the North, but those rejections uh, helped me understand a bit about uh, the barber's work. Um, and so one other barber, right, said, well, you know, because I pushed back and said, well, Barbers, you all saw this back in the 60s and 70s when Black folks were growing Afros and naturals. Uh, and the barber said, yes. And those Afros and, nat and, and uh, naturals damn near put us out of business. That to me was, was this clue that we had been talking about barbershops uh, uh, wrong, that we had completely excised the barber <laughs> out of our discussions of the barbershop. We're talking about barbershops as spaces for black men to go and talk and hang out and be in community with other people uh, without actually taking account for the economy of the shop, right? The entrepreneurship, the labor, et cetera. Um, and so it, it, it occurred to me <laughs> that one, it's quite obvious uh, that these were not just public spaces. These were businesses uh, and barbers essentially, right, had a lot of sway in how their shops would be organized and the kinds of democratic practices that could actually take shape in their spaces. Uh, this also helped me understand George Myers uh, and other folk of his time that exclusively groomed um, uh, white men. And so the story, the arc of the book here, right, uh, uh, moves between, um, uh, I'm just going to show this, this image here, uh, and I'll just, I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, the arc of the book uh, uh, goes from the 18, 1830 to 1970, essentially looking to tell this story of barbers. The framework that I use is uh, there are three, as you can sort of take a look at this at this image here, three groups of people, uh, the barber, uh, the customer, the patron in the barber's chair, uh, and this waiting public. The waiting public are those folk who are sitting in the waiting chairs, right, as you can see in this image. Uh, and we have to think about, again, how these groups of people essentially come to the space. Uh, and so um, uh, with the barber, we're thinking about, again, uh, barbering was an avenue of labor. Uh, it was an avenue of entrepreneurship um, for customers. It was, again, a space uh, for them to come uh, and get their hair cut, to get shaved, uh, 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 to be transformed in some ways. Uh, for folks in the waiting chair, right? For them to be next into the chair. Um, but also, right, to um, uh, interact with, with both familiar folks, but also strangers. 
Um, it's these folks in the waiting chair, though, this waiting public uh, that makes up the public space uh, of the shop. Uh, it's the barbershop where, um, so back in my day when, you know, there were DVDs <laughs> uh, where cats would come by the shop to sell uh, DVDs or to sell watches or to sell oils or, or incense. They came by the shop because they knew there'd be a group of people waiting around in the shop, right? There'd be a customer base, a potential customer base there. Um, and so this waiting public is, is quite is quite useful. Uh, and so that's the sort of framing that I that I that I that I take for the book. Um, and it's important to note here. So this is from this particular image is from 1929 in Harlem. And way in the back of the shop uh, are two women, uh, a manicurist and someone getting their nails, nails manicure there in this barbershop. Uh, so barbershops, yes, are talked about as sort of homosocial spaces where Black men sort of hang out in, for sure. Uh, but I argue that women have always been in barbershops. We just haven't talked about them. <laughs> um, uh, and this image is case in point. Uh, and I'm going to go to the cover of my book. So the cover of my book here, and I just show it here by, to sort of illustrate a point. Again, uh, the barber, uh, and this is this is Joe Gibson. Uh, uh, this is an, an image from uh, the 1970s. Uh, Joe Gibson, 1970, no, it's 1970s. Uh, no, this is I think the 50s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, Joe Gibson, barber. This is in uh, Corona Queens, New York. Uh, the customer, Louis Armstrong. Uh, so barber, customer in the chair, uh, and then it's waiting public, right? So it's an older gentleman here. Uh, in the image, there's another gentleman sitting in the chair, and then two children, uh, a little boy sort of standing, uh, and then a child sitting um, in the chair. Uh, so this is the image. So interesting enough. So this is the image that, um, so I sent my publisher this image. It was bigger. <laughs> they sent it back to me with, um, uh, so that child in the chair is actually a little girl. And so they sent it to me and I said, wait a minute, you actually cut the girl's pigtail off. Um, I want the pigtail in the photo. <laughs> and, they like, and they said, well, why? I said, because I wanted to be known that there, that, that there have always been women in the shop, women and girls in the shop. Uh, and so the actual, you don't see it, the actual cover actually in, in, includes uh, the entire body of the girl, right? Uh, with her pig, uh, pigtails and all. Um, again, just to say that, look, this is the sort of space of the shop uh, that's quite that's quite critical for us to um, to keep in mind. Um, so, uh, black men entered barbering during 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 slavery, uh, and um, what's clear is that um, enslavers uh, employed uh, employees not the, not the white word, but tasks <laughs> uh, 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 their enslaved. Black men to to shave them, to be their body servants, and to shave them, and so uh, this is in, indeed sort of uh, a major way that uh, black men entered barbering again, sort of shaving uh, their 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 enslavers, um, and often their enslavers would uh, hire out um, their barbers uh, to earn extra money, right for for them, right, uh, and those barbers would be able those those enslaved folk who would be able to keep a little bit uh, of their proceeds. Um, um, uh, and some of them would actually eventually use those proceeds to, to purchase their own freedom. Uh, but during the antebellum period, and certainly, certainly before, um, uh, uh, an overwhelming majority, I say a majority, I, I'm going to actually say all, of the commercial uh, barbershops, particularly in the South, um, were owned by Black men but uh, patronized by white men. And so that's the practice in the antebellum period, black barbers, white patrons. Um, and you might sort of wonder, well, why would um, uh, an enslaver sort of trust a black barber um, to hold <laughs> a straight razor uh, to his throat? Um, the answer to that is that those white men 
believed in the fantasies of black inferiority. They believed that black men were not capable of slitting their throats. Um, uh, uh, and so, and so they trusted that fantasy. They believe in that fantasy and trust that fantasy. Um, and certainly there's a way in which those black barbers who stood, um, over those white men, right. With, uh, uh, and this is a, this is an image. Um, I'll come back to that. This, this first image, sorry, is from, um, the, uh, uh the late 18th century, uh, sort of demonstrating, and again, it's a, it's a, um, painting, uh, of, uh, of black folks grooming, grooming each other on a, on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, and so they couldn't go to a shop. Uh, they groomed each other right uh, in front of or inside of uh, uh, the slave cabin, right? And this next image uh, is from uh, the, 18, the 1850s, um, life in Philadelphia, right? Again, sort of, so this image, right? Showing uh, this black barber with this sharp razor uh, to this white man's face and there are tons of other images and um, uh, literature. Um, Herman Melville, for example, which is this um, uh, novella, Benito Sereno, uh, 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 captures this wonderfully, right? Again, of uh, the kinds of mask, right? To invoke Paul Lawrence Dunbar that, that black barbers uh, sort of put on, right? To um, uh, uh, provide this image of deference uh, in order to um, uh, get the things that they wanted and needed. Um, and so this is kind of a practice that black barbers uh, um, um, used. Uh, and so free black barbers, right, who owned barbershops, um, uh, while they groomed white men during the day, uh, there are tons of examples of, uh, of those barbers actually opening their shops to runaway slaves, for example, at night. Um, but those runaways would have to be gone uh, by day uh, before the shop opened because those white customers would have certainly wanted to come in. Um, this practice, black barbers, white patrons carried over into freedom uh, and after emancipation, civil war. Um, and this is something that, that folks like Frederick Douglass uh, had a whole lot to say. <laughs> about these barbers who he and others called them color line barbers, uh, barbers, black barbers for drawing the color line in their barbershops. Um, uh, uh, now let's be clear. So Douglas argued that um, black barbers needed to show a sense of manhood uh, and, and stop excluding black men from entering their shops. Uh, uh, and that, you know, this, this sign of manhood would be a greater sign of a black middle class in freedom. Uh, the problem was that, you know, at the time, in the 18, 1850s, uh, 1860s and 70s, uh, 1880s even, right? Uh, these black barbers, black caterers who were, who were catering to uh, a wealthy white public this was the black middle class, right? Um, and so, and, and, and indeed these were the folk uh, in the antebellum period and immediate postbellum period um, who were driving black abolitionist politics, right? Who were helping to fund um, abolitionist uh, newspapers, um, you know, uh, uh, who were uh, uh, all over the black conventions, uh, uh, again, 1850s and 1870s. Uh, these were the folks, these were key and critical figures. Um, the important part here is that black communities did not sit idle by. So there were tons of protests of uh, black barbers who did not let black men come into those shops. Um, uh, and that to me is a sign that, that black men and black communities um, had an idea of what they wanted in black barbershops, right? So they protested because they needed these spaces, right? And they saw that these spaces owned by black men could be useful to their communities. Uh, and so they engaged in critical protests, uh, 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 particularly right in the 1870s and the 1880s and through the 1890s. A critical thing happens between 1890 and 1930. Um, 
German barbers push for a licensing, push for licensing law, lobbied for licensing laws uh, in the various states across the country. Um, why do they do this? So native white men didn't want to be barbers because they associated barbering with servile labor or slave labor. Um, uh, and that's largely because uh, at the time, uh, barbering, shaving was a big part of barbering uh, in the 19th century. And so uh, shaving certainly one had to sort of caress a man's face. Uh, and white men thought that that was too effeminate, uh, that that was menial and manual labor that they you know, would not uh, stoop to do. Uh, German immigrants didn't mind being barbers. They were barbers in Germany. They came over, they were okay with it. Um, uh, but they also pushed for licensing laws. Uh, black barbers were concerned about these laws because they thought that these were efforts to push them out of the trade. And more specifically, right, to, again, to sort of push them out of the downtown business districts in American cities. Uh, to some extent, they were absolutely right. Um, uh, because these laws, right, then required uh, anyone interested in becoming a barber to go to a barber college. Well, black men were not allowed <laughs> to enter barber colleges. Um, uh, these licensing laws would now say that barbers had to um, know the anatomy of the body, right? That they had to be up and hip on um, uh, uh, public health requirements. Uh, uh, and so white men would say, be careful of those barbershops, those black barbershops, uh, uh, because they're unsanitary, right? Um, uh, so this was a big sort of uh, factor here. Moreover, this is also a moment where the Gillette safety razor comes out, um, where now it was a little bit easier for men to shave themselves at home, uh, which meant that men were going to the barber shops uh, less often for shave, but more often for haircuts. Now for native whites, it was haircutting that took on a lot more skill. Um, and so, now, right, they began to enter barbering in larger numbers. Uh, uh, and then they would again attach themselves on to this licensing, uh, this, this, this licensing movement. Um, last factor here, which is, which is really critical. Uh, this is more of an external factor. Um, black men would then during the 1890s, as a new generation of black men who were born after the Civil War and would come of age in the 1890s. And they would open barbershops explicitly for black men in black communities at a time where Jim Crow is decidedly on the rise. And so these are things that are coming together, right? Uh, at the same time, um, there's a way to also think about uh, the great migration in the same way, right? Where black Southerners move, move from the South, North, uh, and they chose to uh, live uh, in neighborhoods with family and friends. But the, and so there was some choice there, but they couldn't move out. Uh, so black autonomy and black community was there, but also uh, uh, segregation and restrictions were happening at the same time in the same space. And that's the case with uh, 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 this sort of shift and change uh, um, uh, uh, during in the barbary, barbary industry between uh, 1890 and 1930. And so over time, right? So barbers and barber shops are now sort of growing and opening shops in black communities uh, and which would be very, very important um, uh, during the 19, 19 teens, 1920s and 30s uh, because there were few spaces in the public where black men could go uh, and escape the surveillance of white folks. So this is a space again, right, that they were willingly going to, uh, yes, for haircuts, but also, right, to be in a community with other black people uh, outside of the surveillance of a white public. Uh, and so again, these spaces, barbershops would emerge uh, alongside the black church would emerge as important community institutions uh, uh, for black uh, communities across the country. Um, that would be useful during the depression uh, when folks didn't have jobs. 
they had somewhere to go to to hang out, see what see what's going on, see how everybody else is doing. Uh, those barbershops would be um, important spaces for uh, the underground economy. And so numbers running would happen inside these barbershops. That was also really, really important. Um, these shops were important during the civil rights movement in the post-World War II period. Uh, and so uh, SNCC, for example, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, would often have space uh, in barbershops, uh, particularly in the South, uh, to set up and to organize until they got uh, a larger space or until they, you know, in case they just wanted to just be low key uh, before sort of moving into uh, uh, someone's home, for example, right? Again, those shops would be important. Um, Stokely Carmichael, for example, uh, he talked about um, his time in New York, uh, as, you, as you may or may not know. So uh, Carmichael's um, father was from Trinidad. Um, and so when, when, um, uh, when the Carmichael's moved to um, the Bronx, uh, uh, um, Carmichael couldn't, uh, Stokely Carmichael could not get his hair cut in this uh, Irish barbershop that was close to his house. Uh, so he had to actually go to, um, to Harlem uh, uh, to get his hair cut. Uh, and in his autobiography, he talks about that uh, weekly sojourn to the barbershop in Harlem. And he would say that it was in that shop in Harlem that he, uh, uh, that he learned of the Brown decision, that he learned, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, learned about Africa, right? In that barbershop, right? It was there that he would get this important political education uh, and there are many, many black men who would say the same thing both then, uh, but also would say say that now. Uh, and so, th again, there's an important point of willing congregation here. Uh, and so, to make these connections to uh, to black studies, um, I want to talk briefly about uh, protests of white barbershops by black students uh, in the 1950s. Um, so. In the 1950s, uh, uh, where black students were gaining admissions into predominantly white colleges and universities, uh, particularly in, at, in remote places. Um, so like, you know, uh, Antioch College uh, in um, um, Ohio, uh, or, or um, uh, uh, what other places, uh, Vassar in Poughkeepsie, uh, New York. Um, when they got accepted into these colleges, they would go. Uh, one thing that they needed was someone to cut their hair, or certainly for, for women, a petition to uh, to style their hair. Uh, well, in some of these small places, you know, the black shop was not close. The white shop might have been a block or two from the um, uh, uh, the campus, and so black students, right, would try to get it, get a haircut. And those white barbers would say, I don't know how to cut your hair, right? So no, you can't come in. Um, and there were tons of protests. Black students were protesting uh, white barbershops because they would not allow them to come in to get a haircut. Now, this seems like a strange protest, right? Uh, because you might sort of wonder, well, why would those students want to go to those white barbershops? Uh, and in some cases, they Nest didn't necessarily want to trust their, those barbers who cut their hair, but they also didn't want to be told that they could not go into those shops. Uh, and in many cases, the black barbers who might have been like a mile or two from the campus uh, would sort of sit back and say, yo, you know, what are, what are you students doing? You students should be coming to our shops anyway. Uh, but those students were trying to make larger points, right, that, um, that they should not be denied access anywhere that they wanted to go. Um, uh, one, two, African students particularly, right, who, um, uh, uh, and this is by the 1960s particularly, right, when African countries had begun to gain independence. And so African ambassadors who were coming to the States and black students, and African students were coming uh, to go to school. In some ways, they just wanted to get a haircut anywhere, right? And so uh, a lot of these protests we, uh, I see from the evidence, right, were initiated by uh, African students who were coming uh, to the States for education. Um, and so what's interesting here, right, is again, to think about the connections between uh, Black studies and Black barbershops 
is that when we think about black um uh, 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 the emergence of black studies in the late 60s and late 70s, uh, and late 60s and, and early 70s, um, much of their work um, uh, began both on campus but also in the surrounding communities. Um, at Vassar, for example, so I should teach at Vassar, and, and they, as I said earlier, and I had the pleasure of helping to. Uh, organized the 50th anniversary of the F of the Black Studies and Africana Studies program at Vassar, uh, and so in '69, Vassar's Black Studies program actually began not on campus, but in the community of Poughkeepsie. And so uh, there was a it was called the uh, uh, the Urban Center, the Black Studies Urban Center, uh, and so the classes uh, actually took place in the Urban Center in the city of Poughkeepsie, not on Vassar's campus. Uh, and Walter Rodney, there's a great photo of, uh, of, of Walter Rodney giving a lecture in that, in that center in Poughkeepsie. And so the classes were open to both the Vassar students, but also um, uh, 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 the residents, uh, the black residents uh, in Poughkeepsie. Uh, and that's indeed, right, I think that sense of community uh, was was the foundation of Black Studies, um, and I would argue that that same sense of community is 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 what we see uh, um, in barbershops, right? And so, um, the Black Studies movement, right? I would argue, and many have argued, right, was never intended to be a purely academic project. Uh, it was a movement that came out of Black communities, and so when those students and professors were engaging Black communities that surrounded those colleges and universities, they were not quote unquote giving back, um, nor were they participating in what we now call community engaged learning. No, they were home, right? Uh, and, black institu and, and black institutions like barbershops sort of structured their understandings of home. So to say this differently, uh, these black students were actually giving something to the university, right? They were giving the richness of Black culture and the Black experience to the ivory tower. And unfortunately, colleges and universities still don't see nor recognize the gifts before their very eyes. But those folks at the barbershop see it, right? Those brothers in the shop, uh, on the corner, in the park, those brothers have always and still affirm me daily, right? Uh, and say, great job, doc. Uh, glad you're doing what you're doing, doc. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, black students at the University of Nebraska and all over the country, again, sort of feel that same affirmation from black communities. Uh, and so again, I think that when we think about, think about black study and black barbershops, um, there's a way in which um, uh, uh, those sort of grills in barbershops, those barbers who have cut the hair of generations of Black men and Black boys, uh, who have seen communities change, uh, those barbers who have their pulse uh, uh, on what's going on in communities, much like, much like Black pastors. It's no secret why politicians will go inside of barbershops to campaign, because they know that you know, there's a group of men, a community of men who go inside these shops and they trust their barber. They trust their barber to lay down, you know, uh, their burdens to, uh, to engage and talk, right? That intimacy is important. Uh, uh, and so we want to think about Black study and the Black experience. I think there's no other, no, no better place than barbershops and beauty shops uh, where we can engage that work. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, and I look forward to engaging with you and your questions. All right. Thanks, Quincy. That was that was fantastic. Um, so if anyone has any uh, any questions, you can place them in the Q&A um, or you can. Yeah, I prefer you put them in the Q&A so I don't have to scroll through the chat. But uh, I did have a, a couple of questions mm -hmm. and it, it made me think as you were presenting, um, specifically when you talked about how the, the 
black men started, uh, you know, protesting and 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 pushing the barbers to open up their spaces to to, to black men, mm-hmm. and it made me think about, you know, in in social science, uh, especially in 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 black studies and history, we're talking about um, maroon spaces, maroonage, or marinage, some people say, uh, is a big topic. And so there is a way in which you can view the barbershop as a maroon space, you know, yeah. because they, the men come there to, to talk, but sometimes it would be considered seditious speech that mm-hmm. goes on in the barbershop, you know. Um, so so I, I, I thought that was really fascinating when we were talking about that. That really made me think about the issue of maroonage. Yeah, and, and frankly, and that's, and I think many Black students and Black faculty, for, for that matter, uh, see Black studies as that kind of, you know, maroon space, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 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 I, I know that for every institution that I've, so as an undergraduate student, again, majoring in business, uh, it was those, it was African-American history, uh, African-American politics, African politics, social, like it was those courses that like, that was, that was my space. This was my major, right? This is what I was going to get the degree, but my home was not mm-hmm. in the business world. It wasn't in the, in the, uh, the B school. It was in uh, 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 the Afro-American studies department. Right. Um, and so, yes, I think, you know, uh, barbershops serve as serve a similar space, right, um, for Black communities. At the same time, here, right, I think as we think about the practice of democracy, um, uh, those spaces have to be made. And so, um, one of the major points I wanted to make in the in in the book, um, and I often sort of make, is that. Um, um, barbershops are not automatically democratic spaces, right? Uh, it, it really depends on the barber. Again, so let's center the barber here, right? Barbers have, ha- have historically had and still have huge weight on the kinds of democracy that happens in that shop. And so what we know is that, you know, for example, homophobia is, 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 is a big societal problem. Uh, it's a problem within Black communities as well. Um, and for black queer men, some barbershops, not real safe spaces for them to go. Right. Um, uh, uh, and so for women, some barbershops, not really good places for them to go. Right. Uh, 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 it's up to the barber to say that, look, this is how this space is going to be organized. Right. Uh, and so, but that's also to say that any, any, any space, any, space that we consider to be democratic or the possibility of being democratic is to say that that has to be both made and continually remade, right? Um, and so I don't, I, 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 I always hesitate, right, before I sort of, de- sort of deify black barbershops as these great and wonderful spaces for black men to go and talk and hang out and debate. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes no, right? Um, so, but yes, I think it is, you know, they are important spaces of refuge, right? Okay. So um, I wanted to share real quickly, and then I'll get to the um, the questions uh, about some barbershop space. Oh, I need you to stop sharing so that I can share. Yes, I will stop. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So just to share some information about barbershops in Omaha. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, uh, and this is from uh, one of our previous webinars, but mm-hmm. uh, Justin Payne, who is one of our adjunct professors uh, in music, he, his great, great grandfather had the first black barbershop in Omaha. And the location oh, wow. uh, is where the Omaha World Herald newspaper is right now. But this is his, mm-hmm. his great great grandfather or third great grandfather and this was great great grandfather and what's interesting about that is that um this was the father 
And because of the, the barbershop, uh, he had a younger son who was a jazz musician mm -hmm. uh, with the Red Perkins Band, which was the Omaha Jazz Band here. Are you sharing uh, your screen now, Deborah? Yes. Can we you don't see, see it? it. No. Okay. And, and, uh, so no. All right. I cannot see it. Neither can, and, and everyone else cannot see it either. All right. Here we go. All right. Yes. Thank you, Shannon, okay. who said that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So yeah, so this is the, the picture of the inside of the first black barbershop in, in Omaha. Mm. Do we know what year this is? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, he okay. couldn't, he didn't, yeah, he didn't give me the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is the third great grandfather. This is great, great grandfather and his younger brother. So the, the barbershop owner's son was able to become a jazz music, musician. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you think about the, the kind of, um, you have to have a stable background, especially in the early of, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s to be a musician, you know, mm -hmm. for that to be your occupation. Right. Yes. yes. And so that the barbershop, his father having that barbershop kind of laid the foundation for him to be able to pursue that dream full time. Yo, there's so, I think <laughs> uh, that's, a, that, that's a really sort of uh, underappreciated point here. Um, so um, uh, barbering was one of the few industries and occupations where black men had clear access, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, there were very few barriers to entry. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so whether one wanted to, you know, just, you know, work in someone else's barbershop or to start their own, it didn't take a whole lot of, it took some, uh, um, a bit of capital, but not a lot of capital. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, it was attainable. Um, for many black men, barbering became this kind of a way station, right? So this is, I'm, I'm, I'm tying in both, uh, the great, great grandfather and the great grandfather, I, mm -hmm. I think, right? Um, uh, 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 for many men, it was, a, it was a way station, right? So they would, they would be barbers for a bit and they would use it to launch onto other things, you know, uh, unlike, you know, many, many students who, you know, cut hair in their dorm room and they go to class, right? right. <laughs> you know, but they cut hair on the side, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that they can, you know, it, it's a skill that they have and they can make some money with it. Uh, they don't really want to go into the profession, although I think, again, it's a, it, it, it's a noble profession for sure. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that is, and just having that sense of security uh, and having that control and that autonomy, that independence, it's huge, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm glad you showed me that. That's that's a wonderful illustration of, um, again, the kinds of um, uh, 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 economy, right, that we mm -hmm. can get uh, through this through this space. And so you think about the barbershop, beauty shop, the black church. Um, I think those are those are the pillars, right, of institutions, <laughs> you know, that that black folk own in some capacity, right. Mm -hmm. So there's one more thing I want to show you because, um, and it's linking that that political activism in the barbershop mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in Omaha. But uh, let's see, let me share sound. All right, see you so later. Make Omaha different from New York or just incidental. The problem exists because white people think they're better than black people and they want to oppress us and they want us to allow ourselves to be oppressed. This is the big, I agree with you uh, perfectly. This is the basic problem. Then what do you that want white to people uh, think they're better What's than that I can others? Do? I can't solve the problem. You guys pull the strings that close schools. You guys draw the boundaries that keep our kids restricted to the ghetto. You guys write up the restrictive covenants that keep us out of houses. So it's up to you to talk to your brothers and your sisters and persuade them that they have a responsibility. We've assumed ours for over 400 years, and we're tired of this kind of stuff now. We're not going to suffer patiently anymore. No more turning the other cheek. No more blessing our enemies. No more praying for those who despitefully use us. We're going to show you that we've learned the lessons you've taught us. We've studied your history, and you did not 
take over this country by saying we shall overcome. You did not gain control of the world like you have it now by dealing fairly with a man and keeping your word. Your treaty breakers, your liars, your thieves, you rape entire continents and races of people. Then you wonder why these very people don't have any confidence or trust in you. Your religion means nothing. Your law is a farce and we see it every day. You demonstrated it in Alabama. And I can say you because you're part of the whole system. You profit from it. In fact, you make your living from it. You couldn't walk around and talk to people, stand up in your pulpit on Sunday and preach nice little songs and say, now we're going to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and old Jesus be among us. As far as we're concerned, your Jesus is contaminated, just like everything else you've tried to force upon us is contaminated. All right. So that is, the he was a barber, but then he becomes the great Congressman Ernie Chambers. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, so that, that, so in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I like the way the brother kept cutting. <laughs> I'm going to tell you off, and I'm going right. to keep cutting this little, I'm going to keep cutting right. this. And I'm, and I'm not, not going to miss a step. I'm not going <laughs> to He's not going to leave with a little dent in his head. It's going to be perfectly manicured. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for showing that. That's really fantastic. All right. So there was a, a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the barbershop political mobilization nexus? So that's the reason why I showed that, that clip, because yeah. it kind of moves yeah. us in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so talk about political mobilization. Uh, the barbershop, barbershop and political mo mobilization. Yeah. So... Um, uh, so there's two ways to talk about politics here, and I'll be uh, brief, uh, but um, uh, politics in terms of electoral politics. Um, so politicians, uh, both, again, historically, but also still, as we know that Obama had a barbershop and beauty shop campaign, um, uh, uh, and right around election time, you will see a number of newspaper articles where the reporter was going inside of barbershops like that guy did, right, to sort of talk about uh, or to see, or to, to check the mood of Black voters. Um, one problem there is that, you know, um, uh, it's always barbershops. It's seldom beauty shops that they go, right? So that sends a message, right, that, you know, the women aren't talking about politics, they gossip and the men, they talk about politics. Let's talk, let's get the, let's get the, you know, the sort of temperature of Black communities through Black men. Uh, actually, I actually refused to give an interview uh, on one occasion uh, because I, I said, look, if look, you, you should go inside of a beauty shop. Don't come talking to me. Uh, yes, I can talk about barbershops, uh, but we get this over and over again. Right. Y'all need to go inside of beauty shops uh, because it's not the men who have the sort of um, the pulse. Uh, 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 talk to the women. Um, anyhow. So so so, uh, yes, I think there's a way in which. Um, politicians are looking at um, who they see as community leaders. So it's, it's the pastor uh, and it's the barber, right? Again, mostly men, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, I don't disagree with it. But yes, there's a, there's a way to sort of get um, a cross section of people inside of a barbershop, right? So You'll get folk who are working class, who, who don't have jobs, who get students and young folk. You'll get uh, middle class. You'll get the wealthy, even, right, inside of a space, um, which, which is what I think what, what, what makes those, these spaces most interesting. Um, uh, and so we certainly see that uh, with George Myers, uh, I mentioned as early as the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, uh, um, um, we certainly see that in the 1950s and 60s as well, right? Kennedy, um, you know, he wanted to, again, he tried to partner with barbers in some capacity, it didn't quite work. Um, on the political, on the, sorry, the uh, organizing level, um, there's a way in which um, uh, activists who were free of facing economic reprisals were uh, important organizers uh, for civil rights activism. And so uh, barbers, beauticians, you know, like they were, they were not beholden to white employers. They were also not beholden to, to white customers. And so they actually had a bit of freedom. 
to both be directly active, but also to give money uh, to civil rights causes. Um, uh, and so that level of freedom, I, I are, now obviously there were many black folk who, uh, who didn't have the same freedom, but they were still active, right? Uh, they sacrificed a lot, a great deal. Uh, but there's a way in which uh, being able to, again, be your own boss allowed them to, to use their spaces as organizing spaces, but also to help organize uh, uh, themselves. And so, again, I think it's about the, the nature of community that happens in the space that allows them to, um, uh, uh, to engage in, in, in political mobilizing and electoral politics. All right, um, so the second question, a large part of why Black barbershops are so important is the conversations and community engagement, especially for Black men. How do you think we can expand upon these kinds of spaces and create more of them? That's a fantastic question. I don't think I have a good answer. Um, uh, one is, so the first thing is that uh, Let's let's try to preserve this space, <laughs> right? Uh, because with increasing gentrification, uh, there are many black barbershops that are essentially being pushed out, uh, and so that's that's a concern. Two, even those shops that do exist, um, uh, yes, I'm going to blame technology. Uh, technology is making us less. Um, communicative, right, uh, with each other. Uh, so that, too, I think is something that we got to fix. Uh, we're comfortable texting, less comfortable talking to people, right? So that's a, um, a bit of a problem. Uh, three, uh, especially considering COVID, um, uh, we're, we're barbershops and beauty shops, too, right? They had to go by appointments because of COVID, but they're actually starting to like appointment based because they can organize their time a lot better. Um, and so shops that are appointment based means that there are far fewer people hanging out and there are far fewer people talking and engaging, right? The very point that, 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 that uh, the question is, is asking us. And so I'm concerned, right? That those, that these shops are going to be less peopled, right? There'll be less people in them because the shop is based on appointments. Um, how can we preserve that? I gotta tell you, I don't know. Uh, there's a way in which like there are communities of people on Twitter, communities of people on Facebook. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that at all. I'll just sort of say that. Um, people will always need haircuts. People will always need to get their hair done for sure. Uh, and so one, if we can just keep the prices down, <laughs> keep the prices down to be sure that they are accessible. Um, I do think that there are ways to rejuvenate um, uh, barbershops. There are health professionals, community health professionals that are going inside of barbershops to engage black men, particularly around mental health uh, uh, specifically, but also around hypertension. And so there's, I think a really wonderful movement happening there. Um, uh, so I, Part of the part of the work, get to your question, I would argue is to get inside of barber colleges and beauty colleges to say that, look, you budding barbers, uh, these are the kinds of spaces that you can open in in our communities. Right. And so I'm going to say, let's get them while they're students uh, and think about, yes, you're going to open a business, but you're also opening something that's much more than a business. And so I would say that's where to start. Um, something that I'm actually working on in some larger way, uh, uh, but I'll, I can talk more later, but I'll, I'll stop, but that's, that's a way to do it. Yeah. And, and I will say that, uh, because when we first imagined how this webinar would be, we wanted it to be more public facing. Uh, right. so we had initially talked about having a remote in a barbershop and having the men in the barbershop watching and then, you know, interacting at the end, then, you know, COVID just kind of wiped that away. And that's really, but it's really disturbing that after COVID, people will want to continue the, the appointment only. I, I think that that's something that will probably change over time because it's one of those things people are, 
are have gotten tired. I think just general general people are tired of the isolation, uh, and they will want to engage in community spaces. And, and the barber shop is one of those crucial community spaces, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not getting into any gender thing, but you know, uh, you know, men being locked up. Well, not locked up, but I mean, you're at home with your wife all day long, your daughters, and you're like, okay, I just need some man time. <laughs> I need to hang out with the guys at the barber shop. So I think that over time, that will, I mean, and, and the barbers that don't want to do that, I think will start to lose customers because right. as people start moving back into being, you know, into gathering spaces, if your barber shop is not going to be one where, where men can gather, that they will move to someplace else where they can. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. No, yeah. you said it. You said yeah. it. You said it completely. All right. So um, I think we're we're at time. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for being here, uh, and we'll announce that our next webinar will be next Thursday. Uh, we will have. Dr. Valithia Watkins will be speaking on critical issues in Black women's studies. That will be the same time on next Thursday. So as they say in the Black church, if all minds and hearts are clear, <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank you, Dr. Mills, for being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, and I, you have quite a, uh, there are several Chicagoans here, because when I sent this out, I was like, he's, he's from Chicago. So oh. <laughs> I see Brother Anthony oh, Stevens is saying hello. And much love, much love. Rosetta Cash at the very beginning, she, she said hello. So yes, got some Chicago folks here to support you. <laughs> Again, well, thank you. I really wish I could have, uh, uh, I could have been there in person. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I really, you know, uh, enjoyed my time and I enjoyed the questions and I've been scrolling through um, the chat a bit. Uh, and so I, again, just, just wonderful to be with you all and just to be, uh, again, in community and in, and in dialogue. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.